Hello and welcome to the channel. If you are new here, hi, my name is Brittany and I am a nurse practitioner. Much of the content that I create here is educational and I've actually already completed an entire boards prep series here on this channel over a year ago. As you might know, I've actually also collaborated with Archer in the past and I've done total AANP and ANCC reviews with them as well. So I've taken back to my material again, I've updated it and revamped it once more. This time it's a little different though in my presentation and in my delivery because I am using both platforms YouTube and Patreon. So this lecture here is all about hematology in regards to the nurse practitioner boards exam. However, this video here on YouTube is a shortened version. To get access to this complete video and the total audio files for the nurse practitioner licensing exam, then follow the link in the description below and that will take you to my Patreon. There, I will have a total review course and that will be launching on February 27th, 2023, in which you do pay a monthly access fee. Please enjoy this free video here on YouTube to help you study, and then to access again that complete audio files, make sure to become a patron, and on my Patreon, make sure to join the tier titled ANCC and AANP exam prep course. That will give you the total review course. Again, that complete course, however, is not fully launched until February 27th, 2023. I just wanna make sure to give you guys a sneak, a sneak peek of what's to come. All right, so without further delay, let's dive into hematology for the nurse practitioner boards exam. All right, so first up, what is anemia? So anemia is defined as a decrease in red blood cells hemoglobin or hematocrit, and it's characterized by the size and the color of the cells. A low hemoglobin concentration and or a low hematocrit are the parameters that are most widely used when diagnosing anemia. There are some variations in lab value cutoffs, but the most widely used are females with a hemoglobin less than 11.9 or a hematocrit less than 35%, and males with a hemoglobin less than 13.6, or a hematocrit less than 30%. And those are the most widely used cutoffs for diagnosing anemia. There are lots of terms here to be familiar with. So there is the MCV, this, is, this stands for the mean corpuscular volume, and this defines the size of red blood cells. So when you think of MCV, and when you see that MCV, I want you to remember the word volume. It is in the, the term mean corpuscular volume, and volume really tells you what it's looking at. It defines the size of the red blood cells. Then the MCH, this stands for mean corpuscular hemoglobin, and this defines the color or amount of hemoglobin per red blood cell. And so when looking at MCH, it helps to remember the word hue for color, as this defines the color or amount of hemoglobin per red blood cell. And then some other terms here I'm gonna go over as well. These are very useful for practice and for boards. So microcytic, this means small in cell size. Normocytic is normal in cell size, and then macrocytic is a cell that is large in size. And then we have hypochromic, which is a low amount of pigment, normochromic, normal pigment, and then hyperchromic, which is uh, in regards to excess pigment. And then we have the total iron binding capacity, or TIBC, and this tells you how many iron binding sites a person has that is available for iron to bind to. So the TIBC, or that total iron binding capacity, it's increased when the iron is low, and this is because there are more sites available for iron to bind to. So the way that I remember this when studying for my boards was looking at it like hotel vacancies. When the iron is low, that TIBC is high because there are more, of, more vacancies. There's more sites available. Finally, we have the red cell distribution width, or the RDW. 
This is also a really important concept to be familiar with, and this shows us how much the red blood cells are varying in size from one another. Less than 15% variation in red blood cells is considered to be normal. Important to note here is that the RDW does not show the size of the red blood cells, only the variation in sizes. And this is really important to understand because if the bone marrow has been malfunctioning for more than six months, by this time, all red blood cells in circulation will likely be abnormal in size. And so the variation amongst those red blood cells might be less than 15%, even though a vast majority of them are irregular. And so it's just important to understand that that's just showing us variation in size, not necessarily what's normal or abnormal. All right, so let's talk about anemia. First, it's important that we talk about iron deficiency anemia, as this is not only the most common, but it's definitely the most heavily focused on for your board's exam. Iron deficiency, this is a microcytic and hypochromic anemia, and it affects a large proportion of the world's population, especially females of childbearing age, children, and individuals living in low and middle income countries. The major cause of iron deficiency anemia is decreased dietary intake, reduced absorption, and then blood loss. Those are the three main causes. In adults that reside in resource-rich countries, so for example, United States would be considered a resource-rich country, dietary intake is not an issue here. It is almost always adequate. And so in the U.S., it's usually reasonable to assume that the cause of iron deficiency anemia is due to blood loss until it's been proven otherwise. So overbleeding, this is a term for visible bleeding. Examples of overbleeding would be traumatic hemorrhage, hematoemesis, so blood in the vomit, hemoptysis, which is coughing up blood, hematochesia, blood in the stool, heavy menstrual bleeding, hematuria, or blood in the urine, pregnancy, and then delivery. Other causes and risk factors for iron deficiency anemia in adults is gastric ulcer disease or gastritis, uh, colorectal cancer, bleeding disorders, GI parasites, surgical blood loss, frequent blood donation, and then hemodialysis. All of those are additional risk factors. In patients that have reduced absorption, they are not, of course, losing blood. They're getting enough in their diet, but they're not absorbing it. So who's going to be at risk for reduced absorption? The patients that we want to worry about, that would be uh, those with celiac disease. They're at risk for reduced absorption, iron deficiency anemia, H. pylori infection, gastritis, and those patients that have had bariatric surgery. Those are the population of people that we're going to be concerned with that reduced absorption. So on exam, patients with iron deficiency anemia, they typically appear normal, uh, depending on, of course, the severity of their anemia. If they're very anemic, then you might, you might see some positive findings on exam. So examples of positive findings that you would see in a, a more severe case, so pale, dry skin, there is atrophic glossitis. This is where the tongue becomes really smooth because it's lost its papillae. There is angular chelitis. So if you look at pictures, it looks like just cracking around the mouth, but it's erythema and fissures that appear at the corner of the mouth. Uh, Coilonychia, so that spooning of the nails. And this is where the nails really, they kind of appear concave. They kind of cave in. Alopecia, this is rare. Um, and it's generally, if it is present, it's in very severe cases, but we can see alopecia as well. Patients with anemia, they can also report symptoms too. If they are feeling symptomatic, the things that they would report would be more things like fatigue, tiredness, uh, pica, so that's uh, craving things that are not food, specifically ice. That is a big one with uh, patients that have iron deficiency anemia. Restless leg syndrome, headache, uh, uh, exercise intolerance, exertional dyspnea, weakness, all of those could be potential symptoms that patients experience with iron deficiency anemia. 
So iron store, uh, iron studies, they can be ordered as a panel and that really gives us a more complete picture. And so on that iron study, things included would be a serum iron, transferrin, um, and this is off, often also reported as the to that total iron binding capacity, that TIBC that we talked about, uh, a calculated transferrin saturation, and then a ferritin level. And so those are the big components on those panels. And so let's look at a couple of these components. So we have a serum ferritin. This is really important with iron deficiency anemia. A serum ferritin less than 30, this is confirmatory, confirmatory, confirmatory for the diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia. A serum ferritin less than 30 confirms a diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia. However, there's a little bit of a caveat, there always is, right, in medicine. However, complex patients, they can require more testing. And so this is because, like I said, although a ferritin level less than 30 is considered diagnostic for iron deficiency anemia, a ferritin in the normal ranges does not exclude iron deficiency anemia, meaning that a patient could have a normal ferritin and still have iron deficiency anemia. It confirms a diagnosis, but it can't rule a diagnosis out.